Uh, it's about time to get started uh, this evening. I see a few people still logging on, uh, but welcome to the uh, webinar number three in our six-part series. Tonight, we're going to be talking about patient evaluation and consultation, and we're glad that you're with us tonight. If you were one of the uh, dentist who was with us on the first or second, welcome back. And if you're uh, new to this, you can view and uh, listen to the first two webinars uh, through Keller's website if you'd like to do that, and that'll get you up to speed. Welcome one way or the other, and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Glad to have everyone back. It looks like quite a few people are back from the first and second series. Uh, we want to thank Keller Labs again for helping us put this seminar on. Uh, they've been very beneficial in, in helping us with our sleep practices, and I know they can help you with the same. They're a full-service dental lab. All the appliances are made here in the United States. Uh, they provide some of the, the better oral appliances uh, for snoring and sleep apnea. They've got a great staff there that can help you with questions. They're dedicated to customer service and dental education, and they're very proud sponsors of American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. And let me tell you a little bit about Dental Sleep Solutions. We are a franchise opportunity that is designed to be a turnkey solution for dentists to get into dental sleep medicine and to get this up and running and implemented in your practice. Guy and I both have over 10 years of experience treating patients. Next slide you'll see is, is just uh, our mug shots, and we think we can add something to what you're doing, and we hope that you will at least visit Dental sleepsolutions.com to learn more about us. We'd love to talk to you about uh, the opportunity that we have. But for now, let's go ahead and get started with our webinar tonight. Thanks, Rich. Uh, thanks also again for the people who are attending our, our previous two webinars. Uh, we have a six-part series we put together. This is the third part of that series. Uh, September 14th is the next webinar after this one. It's, we're going to go over patient protocols during that webinar. October 12th, we're going to talk about how you titrate or, or adjust dental devices, how we know where to move the dental devices and when to move them, managing the side effects that, that occur on occasion. And then finally, the one that, uh, you know, maybe somewhat the most important, arguably, is practice marketing and medical insurance billing. You've got to get paid. We love doing this, but we also want to help you learn how to make money doing this as well. If you have signed up for this webinar, then you're automatically enrolled for the other webinars. Also, I want to mention a course, or maybe Rich, you want to say something about the course that, uh, that we're doing on October 7th in San Antonio, Texas. We're doing something nobody's ever done before, and that's uh, offering a full day course. And we have some more information later on, but it's a, it's a, San Antonio is a great place to be in the fall. It's finally cooling off then. Uh, you can visit the Alamo and Fiesta, Texas, and see world and all kinds of fun places like that. We have the river walk too, but uh, we're doing a full day course and we're only charging $95 for dentists and $45 for staff. Uh, we're going to limit that to 50 people. And since you all are on the webinar at this point, you're going to have first shot at that. And uh, we hope you'll take advantage of that. I can say uh, it's not, not that people haven't done seminars before, but I, to doing it for $95, uh, I think uh, you can't, can't really afford not to come. All right, we'll get going. Uh, important for a little house uh, cleaning work here, uh, housekeeping rather. If you want to get credit for this, it's very important that you follow these guidelines to get your CE credit for this webinar. You'll receive an email from Dental Sleep Solutions sent to the email address that you use to register. You must correctly complete a 10-question quiz within seven days of receiving this email. You click on the email, enter the required information, and then complete the quiz. You need your American Academy General Dentistry number, uh, ID, and if you're not a member, just put NA. Very good. Okay. Well, let's keep on moving. Some of the things we want to go over today are the consultation. Uh, when we look at a PSG, PSG is the polysomnogram. That's the sleep study, remember. W what specifically are we looking at or looking for? They're all different, and sometimes they're at the f information's at the front, sometimes at the back. You all know most of the patient history and physical exam. We'll talk more specifically about what we think you should do with that. Mal and Patty will talk about that anatomical considerations when we look at people's tongues and their occlusion and things like that and how that affects what it is we want to do tools of the trade for assessing the airway what do we have in our back pocket what can we use and uh, the last few things would be how do we document what we're doing and uh, inform consent and the uh, 
take you back to dental school and oral surgery department when you first learned to make soap notes. So that's the uh, overview, and we're going to go ahead and jump in and get started right now. First of all, we're going to make an assumption that patients have been sleep tested and been diagnosed with sleep disordered breathing, or maybe I should say been at least ruled out of having sleep disorder breathing or obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the days of just making mandibular advancement devices for patients uh, just because they snore without having some sort of sleep test, uh, I, I hope are over because it's um, the majority of these people have at least sleep disorder breathing and we do need to do some sort of sleep test, whether it's a polysomnograph or home sleep test prior. Good point, Guy, and I think you're exposing yourself to some uh, legalities if you don't do it that way. Not heard of anyone getting sued one way or the other, but that's a good point. Let's talk about a consultation. Uh, that's where this starts, and um, you've got to kind of put a different hat on when you're doing sleep. It's a little bit different than your general dental practice, maybe. I know personally I run my dental practice, which uh, is a little bit differently than I do my sleep practice. Do you do a free consultation or do you charge for it? My personal preference, and Rich can testify to what his is, is anyone referred by the medical community in particular you're just not going to build those relationships with the, the physicians if the patients are charged for it. The physicians want to know what it costs them to come in. And if you'll go to your medical community and talk to your primary cares and sleep docs and say, hey, I'll do this for – see these patients at no charge to them, uh, you're going to open up that door. Now, your patients of record and other ones, you can kind of do it either way, in my opinion. Uh, do you do it before or after the patient evaluation? We see patients who maybe we suspect of having a sleep disorder breathing, and then patients who have already had a diagnosis, and you've got to separate those, those two out. Uh, the very, very most important thing, I think, is addressing their chief complaint. We were taught this in dental school, or uh, most dental schools teach it this way, I assume, that you want to address what the person's there for, but it's even more important than sleep. Uh, the patients often are coming because they're snoring and it's bothering the spouse, or maybe they're there because they had a heart attack or their cardiologist sent them, but understanding what motivates that patient is extremely important. Prior to the patient arrival, we typically review the previous medical history. We review the sleep test. Uh, I go through it, highlight it. Now I've trained one of my staff members to do that and pull out the pertinent information, AHI, LSAT, and all the things we talked about in the previous webinars. Uh, and then we have all that information in front of us ahead of time. And then we do a cursory exam on these consultations. Uh, I explain to the patient, if they're not a patient of record, that I'm not really their dentist, for the, even though I am a dentist. I'm here to see if their teeth are strong enough to hold this dental device. That's the purpose of my exam. It's important to do a soap note, which if you're familiar with that, most of you should be, is subjective, objective of assessment and plan. Your progress notes in that form, it helps you legally. It also may help you get paid by insurance companies uh, down the road. You want to review the risk, benefits, and alternatives of treatment. I put in everyone's chart, we went through the RBA of treatment. I don't just put it in the chart. We make sure they understand all the alternatives out there, whether it's CPAP or surgeries or, or other things we've talked about in past seminars. Make sure you document document it as well, not just tell them, but document it as well. Uh, we make some treatment recommendations, tell them whether we feel they're a good a candidate or not. Uh, and then in our office, and one thing we're big with in our Dental Sleep Solutions franchising is doing pre-authorizations prior to the patient's begins treatment. We can find out oftentimes what their insurance may cover, uh, and, and that may help getting uh, patients to say yes to treatment. I can tell you, if you do it that way, you have success rates. In my practice, we track some software, our proprietary software we use helps track uh, acceptance case consults per beginning treatment, and I review that once a month in my office. And right now, 67% of the people who come in for this quote-unquote free consultation begin treatment. So, you know, it's worthwhile doing it if you do it correctly. Correctly. That's good, Guy. One, I'm going to try to – some of these questions are coming in, and uh, I'm going to try to throw some of these out earlier rather than all at the end. And somebody just uh, typed in, Guy, can you charge for a consultation? And uh, that's a good question, and yes, you can. There are codes out there, medical codes, that you can use for that. Uh, not, they're the 99-200 codes, 201, 2, 3, 4, 5, and they, they're very uh, – if you – in fact, you do that – you need to make sure that you're doing everything that those codes say that you're supposed to be doing. However, Guy correctly pointed out that it probably works better if you don't. You just get them in there and you do this, but you can. And, and again, I'm talking 
primarily about referrals from the medical community. A lot of you who are on the webinar tonight are maybe just getting started, and you're going to be starting in your own offices with your own patients. You know them. Do with what you may with them. Uh, but as you grow your sleep practice and, and start, I call it turning on the faucet, you start opening up the, the referrals, and once you get them coming, it's, you know, it just they start flooding in. It, it just works better if the medical community knows that they can refer you someone, and they can tell that patient, look, go over, see what they have to say. It won't cost you anything out of your pocket. Good point. Really, the goal of this initial consultation, we have a couple of goals. One, is this patient even a candidate for dental device therapy? I think back to when I got started with this, and I started, I probably talked for 15 minutes with a patient about making them a mandibular advancement device, and they had dentures. And uh, you can't really do that if they have dentures. So you might laugh at that now, but it was a really good set of dentures, <laughs> by the way. And, and but, but that's what we want to figure out. Are they a candidate for this? We're addressing their chief complaint. We're doing those types of things. And uh, then we want to proceed from there. As mentioned earlier, prior to seeing the patient, we need a diagnosis. And oftentimes that's in the form of a PSG or this slide will work just as readily for a, reviewing a test given via ambulatory studies. But I think making sure you have that in your hand if they've had a sleep study prior to the consultation is imperative. It's kind of a waste of time. You don't know what you're dealing with. Someone who has an AHI of 90 uh, versus someone who has an AHI of 6, part of whether they're a good candidate for treatment is their diagnosis. And so having this in hand, reviewing it, pulling out this pertinent information you can see on the screen prior to them coming to your appointment, making sure you, that you kind of got a feel what the level of apnea is for that patient prior to even walking into the room for the consult is important. We review this and uh, the things on the screen, you can read them for yourself. The AHI is, or RDI are, of course, mandatory to know. I certainly, uh, and, you know, you read the other items, you know, supine AHI higher than prone or side AHI uh, to me is a positive predictor of treatment. Uh, how low their oxygen went. Percentage below 90 is also something we want to look at. If it's they're down there 20% of the night, we may be a little bit more afraid to treat them with a dental appliance than someone who's only down below 91 or 2%. Uh, what's their snoring level? PLM stands for periodic leg movements. People who have periodic leg movement disorder may, you may help their apnea, but they still may have some tiredness or sleepiness because of other comorbidities like periodic leg movement. Uh, we look at the sleep staging, which is one of the big advantages to a PSG over home sleep testing, and look and see how much delta sleep they got. Look and see how much REM sleep they had and, and their sleep efficiency. Did they actually sleep during the test? Uh, I don't know about you, Rich, but one of the things that people always come in and say, oh, I had that sleep study and I didn't sleep at all. I, I didn't sleep at all that night. And I can look right there at their sleep efficiency, which is basically the percentage of the night that they were asleep while they were laying there in, in the bed at the PSG. And I can say, uh, yes, Mr. Jones, you did sleep. As a matter of fact, you slept 80% of the time if the sleep efficiency was 80. We know that because we're measuring your brain waves, so it's a nice number to pull out. And, of course, their diagnosis. You have to have this legally. You have to have it for medical insurance, but also it helps to determine whether you're going to do a good job with um, treating them with a mandibular advancement device. Very good guy. And also remember, a lot of these patients who are coming in, and you're a, one of their first contacts with someone, even those who have failed CPAP and some other treatment modalities, they don't really understand the disease and the disease process. So we always take a couple of minutes to say, do you, do you understand what this is? Do you understand that your airway is closing down and you're not getting enough oxygen? That's what these numbers mean. Your oxygen drops to this level and it stays there for this long and those types of things. So th those are all good things to point out. And one of the reasons we do that, of course, is to make the patient aware that they have a problem. When we talk about timing is everything, if people don't know they have a problem, then they're less likely to want to fix it. So when we look at their chief complaint, I just snore. My wife kicked me out of the bedroom. I want to get back in the bedroom. I don't care if I have sleep apnea. I don't care if it's going to kill me. Uh, that doesn't sound like something a healthy person would say. So you have to think about where they are and what they're doing. And remember, is if you explain this to them in the disease process, most uh, reasonable people will be much more receptive to your treatment recommendations and moving forward with therapy. Yeah, I, I like to quote one of my mentors, uh, Pete Dawson, who lives right across the bay from me here in Florida. And, and I remember going to one of his courses years ago, and he said, every reasonable person wants a healthy mouth. And that's kind of what he bases a lot of his 
treatment protocols as far as educating patients. And if we believe that every reasonable person wants a healthy mouth, well, then all we have to do is educate them and make them aware. I think we use the word education. I like this because it's aware. And I've just taken what he says, and hopefully with his blessing, I could say every reasonable person wants to be healthy and to not snore and to not be tired and all the things that come with sleep apnea. So we just make them aware of these problems, and they will want to fix it. You know, you're a dentist. You're used to doing this on a daily basis with dental problems, but it's just a, it's a similar situation, but you're talking about something different. If you can talk to somebody about saving a tooth, you can certainly talk to them about saving their life in and around some of the same costs that you may charge for a, a crown or two. Very good. Next, we'll talk about patient history and physical exam. There's probably nothing here I can tell you that you don't already know. We do have a scale in our office, and we do actually weigh people. We do actually take their blood pressure, uh, and we do actually measure their height. I don't know. People lie about those things. I don't know, but we just want to have a good idea and a good baseline. These other types of things, you're looking at their teeth and their occlusion. Mandibular plane angle is one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later that is a predictor of success. Basically, the flatter their jawline is, the better candidates they are. Uh, are they having any TMJ issues? Are they having issues with the joint or muscles, things like that? And again, when we review the PSG, we're looking at the severity of the apnea. And we had another question here about somebody earlier on one of the slides. They talked about the AHI and RDI. Are they the same? No, they're not actually the same. The AHI is the apnea hypopnea index, and the RDI RDI is the respiratory disturbance index. The AHI obviously adds up the apneas and hypopneas and indexes them per hour. The RDI adds in RERAS or the respiratory effort related arousals in addition to the apneas and hypopneas. So some physicians will report AHI, others RDI. We seem more and more to see people reporting both, and uh, those are just things that you'll look at. Uh, again, you can review the webinars we've previously done on Keller's uh, website, which we address some of those issues. Uh, one thing I want to mention is you said TMJ issues, and there was a question that came in also about um, can you make devices? Is it a contraindication? I think it's exactly what it says. Uh, TMJ issues a contraindication for uh, mandibular advancement devices. The answer is no, not usually. Often, many, many TMJ problems, clicking, popping, we don't have time to get into all of them here, but suffice it to say that many people with quote and unquote TMJ issues or TMD are still very good candidates for dental appliances. You need to make sure your physicians know that that's not a contraindication as well so that they don't disclude someone because of something that they're not really qualified to, to decide. Yeah, we could talk for three hours about the relationship between bruxism and grinding and clenching and sleep disorder breathing. It seems like there are more and more things being published uh, every month, literally, that talk about that. So bottom line, though, is that a lot of the TMJ issues that people have go away when we treat their airway. Absolutely. This is a chart that you can get off the internet or anywhere if you just Google images and a BMI type of thing. And on the left side, you have height, and on the right side, you have weight. You can figure out the BMI by weight in pounds divided by height in inches squared, and then multiply that by 703. Uh, where am I on this chart? Uh, I'm kind of in the middle. I've been creeping up towards that right side, uh, I'm sorry to say, and then most of your patients will be there too. And we just want to make them aware of where they are on this chart and always talk about weight and losing weight and how that can help them. Yeah, I had a patient the other day, we were going through the BMI, and they said, you know, I, I'm not overweight, I'm just under tall. So I think this <laughs> emphasizes that there as well. All right, we'll move on. Slide 16, Nathan. Okay, patient history. It's it, it, This is really key, not only in understanding what your patient concerns are and addressing their chief complaint, it also becomes important as we titrate or adjust the appliances down the road to see how well they're working. I, I think it's important to understand where you are as well as where you're going and how many night, hours a night they sleep at night. If someone only sleeps five hours a night and they have insomnia or other problems that are keeping them from sleeping to proper hours at night, then maybe you, you may help their airway. 
but they still might be sleepy. Headaches in the morning, more and more I'm beginning to, I used to always think this was TMJ problems, often related. It's that big circle we were just talking about a moment ago, very much related to apnea in many, many cases. Sour taste in the mouth uh, or dry mouth. TMD, we just mentioned, bruxism, excessive daytime sleepiness, which is, you know, oftentimes their number one complaint, and it's very rewarding when you can take someone who's very sleepy and, and make them not so sleepy. Uh, change in weight, nasal congestion. I've had a cold recently. I may still sound a little bit congested. I know when I had uh, nasal congestion, my personal uh, sleep disorder breathing goes up. It makes it more difficult for me to even be treated with an oral appliance. So I'm taking a history of that. People who have nasal congestion, you may aren't quite as good of candidates. Do the patients exercise? Uh, what's their caffeine and alcohol intake? Because alcohol can certainly make apnea worse. Uh, a lot of times people say, well, I only snore when I have a few drinks. Well, they may only have apnea when they drink, or their apnea may be worse when they're drinking. Yeah, I, ha I had a patient the other day, a guy came in and she said, I said, well, are you a drinker? She said, well, I, I have a glass of wine with dinner and and maybe one after dinner. And I said, well, how big is a glass? And she said, well, <laughs> it, you know, two glasses is a bottle of wine. So these are all things you want to talk about. Okay, we also want to talk about with patients have they been treated before and what type of treatment have they undergone? Have they had a dental device? Uh, we seem to be seeing more and more people who are buying these ones off the internet. And if they have a little bit of success with those, we can, that, that's a good sign. We can certainly uh, improve on that by making them a custom made device. How many surgeries have they had? Have they had their septum straightened? Have they had turbinates? adenoids, tonsils, those types of things. And the people who have tried CPAP and failed it, they're not shy about telling you that they don't like it. And we, of course, want to look at their sleep studies and uh, what other physicians and dentists have said about this patient. I agree. The uh, only thing I would mention is that uh, if someone's had a over the internet boil and bite type appliance and they weren't successful, that doesn't necessarily mean they won't be successful with a custom made dental appliance. Good point. For, for various reasons. As we're trying to determine if someone is a good candidate for a dental appliance, whether we think it's going to help them and whether they can adjust to it and tolerate it, we need to look at their anatomy. BMI, if the more obese a patient is, the, the less likely it is that a, a dental appliance will work quite as well. Uh, their neck size, which kind of goes hand in hand, but not always. Sometimes you see obese people with small necks and vice versa, but neck size, BMI are kind of tied together, as, as you can imagine. Uh, their occlusion, people who have retronathic profiles tend to respond better to dental appliances and also I might even say I think that the side effects of bite changes uh, tend to at least in my opinion be a little bit less worrisome the size of their tongue that above the occlusal plane is it retracting into the opening when they open their mouths a scalloping that type thing soft palate and uvula you can tell just do this when you start looking at your patients look back at their uvula and if it looks all red and elongated and just not uniform, uh, just start asking a patient about their snoring. You can tell someone who snores oftentimes just from the condition of their uvula. The position of the hyoid bone. The more inferior the hyoid bone is, the uh, less likely a dental appliance will work. Spaces. Rich, you can read these if you want to. Well, you're just looking at those. If you're going to do CT scans or, you know, some of the newer technologies, those are just the spaces behind there. If you're into that stuff, you can do it. Uh, we've talked a lot about TMJ and that type of thing. So uh, I do want to just point out that people need to be able to move at least five or six millimeters probably before you can help them. So that's one of the things you want to look at. The next slide, we talk about malimpatic classification and that is a scale that was developed and is used by anesthesiologists to assess the ease of intubation when they want to intubate someone and put them to sleep and basically as you can see with the pictures there they just open their mouth stick their tongue out how much of the back of their throat can you see I can see all of it. it's class one I can see none of it it's class four and then two and three can kind of be in between there and, and that's just something that we want to document and look at and uh, our next slide I don't know where a guy found this next patient but uh, sure had a big tongue, didn't he? <laughs> he sure was tasty, if you ask me, but uh, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll move on. 
uh, this, this is more the tongues we're used to looking at. And uh, I think the same guy's tongue is in everybody's presentation in the whole country, I've decided. But uh, you don't have to go very far to see scallop tongues. Just start looking for this. And then back to this and the Malin Patty, I think are very good tools uh, or information to go over with your patients for them to raise their awareness of the problem. Explain to them what the scalloping of the tongue is caused from, from the, indi- from the pressure against the teeth. Either the tongue's too big for the, the arch, the arch is too narrow, or they have a tongue protruding habit, all of which could mean that the tongue doesn't have enough room. The Mal and Patty, Rich, I like going through that store. Uh, I like telling that story to my patients and then letting them see where do you think you are on here? And they say, oh, I'm over here in the four. Oh, well, that must mean you have a more narrow airway. Uh, it's a very good patient education tool to uh, raise a patient awareness. Yeah, you, you had that picture of the fish up there. I have to tell you a story. One of my uh, fishing buddies here in San Antonio is an ENT doc, and I tease him all the time because I say, have, have you ever seen a straight septum? And uh, he said, of course not. You know, it's uh, $2,500 to fix one, so they're all crooked. But we want to keep in mind the relationships and the referral patterns that we have with our physician colleagues. I am a firm believer that anything that your ENT colleagues can do to help our patients breathe better through their nose is going to help our dental devices work better. So as I make more referrals to my ENT colleagues, I tend to see more coming back. And that's just kind of human nature, I think. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. That's certainly something that we want to think about always running in the back of our minds. Yeah, one of my best referrals for one of my uh, sleep offices is an ENT. He sends me several patients a week. I think they can be very good referrals, and then we need them to help us. So totally agree. These are some things that every time a, a patient opens their mouth and you look in the back, you're looking at how much room is back there, and you're just trying to get a feel for how crowded the airway is. You know what the uvula is, and you have the two uh, arches, the supratonsillar and the and the palatal pharyngeal arch is the one more towards the back, and, and the, the tongue, and just the, the tongue covers their teeth and it scallops. So just kind of get this going in the back of your mind when you're looking at these patients and looking at this. And they're all subtle indicators for our devices and how well we can use them. You know, one thing I always say is if you're working on a tooth and you're wrestling the tongue, that's what we do as dentists often is wrestling a tongue. The, the comedian, I can't think of his name, there, goes, there's your sign. If you're prepping number two and the tongue's in your way, just think about what that's tongue doing when it has no muscle tone at all in REM sleep. There's your sign. So, Again, these are just some photos of what we maybe don't pay enough attention to as dentists. I want to hope that everyone who's listening, uh, the dentists that are signed on tonight, will start looking more at the soft palate, looking back towards the tonsillar area, looking at the uvula, and starting to think, hey, can air get through there? Does anything look different? It's like anything else. If you start looking at them, you will start seeing the difference between them. And look how narrow this is, and the uvula is elongated. Something's going on in that person's airway, and it's going to be more difficult to get the air through it. Yeah, and you'll even hear people talk about, I wake up with a sore throat all the time. And you look back there, and it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but their uvula looks like uh, it's been a one of those little boxing things that you just hit all night, just pop, 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 pop. And, and they'll talk about that, and they'll talk about it being sore. And again, that's another sign. I wear an appliance every night. Occasionally, I'll fall asleep sitting on the couch or something like that. And if I decide to take a nap and forget to put my appliance in, literally... For the next day, I feel like I can sense my uvula in the back of my throat. I can feel it kind of like there's you know, something hanging back there. It's, it's very bothersome. So I can attest to that from a personal standpoint. Wow. You guy opens his mouth and you see something like that. And you can't even see the bottom of his uvula. So uh, that, that's just a crowded airway. Enough said. We mentioned the hyoid bone earlier, and if we look at the mandibular plane angle, which is from the, the chin to the to the back of the jaw there, uh, I believe it's going on to some kind of eon or something. I'm not an orthodontist, but when we look at that and we draw a perpendicular line to that, to the hyoid bone, the more inferiorly placed that hyoid bone, the longer that distance is, obviously, 
and the more severe their sleep apnea is and the less likely we can help them with a dental device. So if you routinely take CEPHs or you have patients who have had CEPHs and this is something that you can do and look at, it's another tool that we have in our, in our back pocket. And I think if we're not taking steps, what we were saying previously is people who have a longer distance here typically have a steeper angle to their mandible. Is that what you were saying? That's correct. Okay. So if you're they're not taking a step. With, yeah, they're the people with the longer longer faces, the Abraham Lincoln looking kind of people. Their chin is just a long ways from their forehead. Sounds like somebody I know when I look in the mirror every day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, let's evaluate the, the upper airway. H how can we do this? And, you know, this is maybe controversial to some degree because, first of all, the patients aren't asleep and the anatomy acts differently when they're awake versus asleep. But I think there, you can gather some information that's of benefit. Uh, nothing takes the place of a sleep study or a follow-up sleep study of, of some sort with a dental device in place. That really is the proof as to whether it's working or not. But we can gather some information from PAN, CEPHs, cats, MRI, CT scans, uh, acoustic pharyngometry uh, I use in my office. It helps, but uh, none of these things take place of, of sleep studies. Physical exam uh, is important, also, I think, as well for us to, to look and to see if we, we feel that by moving their jaw forward, it's going to make a difference and it also helps for our documenting for medical purposes. I personally never use nasal pharyngoscopy. Have you, Rich, do you do that routinely in your office? No, and most dentists aren't going to have that, but but it is a dynamic way to look at the airway, just like with acoustic pharyngometry. You know, we're actually, you know, with we can take a picture of something, but we don't really see how air is moving through there. If we test it with acoustic pharyngometry, and here you see the machine that they hold up into their mouth, and then the graph on the right, and it's it's charting distance against that versus surface area, and it does have some value. We're all visual learners, and I think patients like to see this, and they like to see that their airway is a little more open when they move their jaw forward. But these are just ways to look at the airway. The next slide shows the uh, iCAT with some special software in there, and that is just as cool as can be. If you look at that and you compare that to the previous CEPH or something that we see, it's very difficult to look at the airway and mark what those landmarks are. This makes it a little bit easier, and more and more dentists are starting to get these. I'm not sure I see a value in doing this on every single patient, but if you have one of these and you can do it and you can wrap it into what you're doing, again, it becomes a visual or a learning type of thing for the patients. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think anything that you could do to help educate the patient, my only concern with this would be radiation, of course. Personally, I think it, it can help convince patients what's going on in, in their situations. One thing I do want to address, which we just breezed over, and I think it's worth coming back to, is you do need to evaluate whether the patients can breathe through their nose or not one way or another. Uh, I do use the rhinometer. I like that because it, uh, I don't have to look in their nose, and it gives me a, an idea of what's going on in their nasal airway. But whether you use the, the speculums or whether you just tell them to breathe through their nose and ask them if they have questions, uh, it, it is a positive predictor of treatment or a negative predictor of treatment whether they have uh, nasal obstruction. And it also makes it for a good referrals if uh, networking with your ENT. Airway assessment, again, I think I, I already hit on this a moment ago. Sleep study, sleep study, sleep study. That's the only way we know if you have apnea or upper airway resistance or other sleep disorder breathing. And it's the only way we know if our treatments are working from an objective standpoint. You have to follow up with sleep testing uh, and you have to have a test prior to treatment. Specifically, when we look at uh, patient records that we're actually going to put down, dental, medical history, most of you are not doing this full-time and you're dent general dentist and you're incorporating this and learning to incorporate this into your practice. So you're going to be very aware of, of their dental history, if they're patients of your record. But we look at medical history and we make notes if they've had surgeries and they've done this. We've already hit on the SOAP notes. Uh, the next couple of slides, we'll talk about uh, the models that we use. Guy and I both started to do that. When you look at and you take pictures of these patients, you want to take at least these four. You can do this uh, in their mouth. You can do this with models where you just take one head face on like that, and you take one from the right, and you take one from the left, and then we just take the models and turn them upside down, and then we take another picture like that. So you can see contacts and where the teeth are, and, and these we're just documenting for those reasons. But uh, go, go back up a couple more slides, Guy, to the uh, 
patient history. There was something else I wanted to talk about there uh, besides those photos that you see there. Yeah, thank you. Um, the exam cheat sheet. You know, we – Guy and I both started doing this about 10 years ago, and, and we kind of dug up everything that we have out of the ground, and we put this into our systems and our tools for what we're doing in Dental Sleep Solutions. And those cheat sheet type of things are all of the information that you have from their sleep study and, and all of the pertinent information so that you can kind of take – one peek at one page and you can get a really good idea of where the patient is and where they've been and those types of things. Yeah, without that, you're going to spend an awful lot of time flipping through the chart. What's the AHI? You know, what's the LSAT? What's uh, what's their chief complaint? You've got to come up with some systems. Of course, we've come up with ours and perfected them, but regardless, suffice it to say, you've got to come up with a way to, to not be flipping through 100 pages of the chart notes and everything to kind of get that person at a glance. Just to make sure I understand you, Rich, you take pictures of the study models themselves or of the patient? We just take pictures of the study models that we, we take at the patient. What we do is uh, exactly the same thing except for we take photos of the patient themselves, basically the same pictures you see here. I think it's a good documentation of bite prior to treatment and all the things that Rich said. Uh, we also take a mal and patty photo and a face and a lateral photo as well. So. And it's hard to get overkill when we talk about records. Right. Every time you every time you get sued, you know you never have enough records. And I don't know of anybody who is, but at any point, do what you're comfortable with, and we're trying to give you at least the minimums that you can do. And with the informed consent, especially because when we look at doing devices on these people, we're gonna move some teeth, and we talk. We'll talk some more in, in our other next webinar actually about uh, managing side effects and doing things. But teeth can move and they do move. So when we think about an informed consent and what we need to tell the patient, we want to say this is what we want to do. Here are the reasonable alternatives to that. Of course, the attorneys tell us that patients have the right to make the, the choices with this and failing to provide these patients w with the information that is reasonable, then we open ourselves up for some liability. So enough said about that. You can get uh, informed consents from the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, and uh, they, they have a good one on their website, and uh, there it is there. So... Yeah, and just to reiterate, you will move teeth, you will change bites, but you will save lives. So uh, it's not your decision, it's the patient's decision, but they need to understand that they're weighing the risks against the benefits, and you know, it's, only the, it's the right thing to do, and it's the legally right thing to do as well. The soap note, I, we talked about it earlier, and it's important in probably all medical records, but especially in our dental offices when we're talking about dental sleep medicine. Uh, it stands for Subjective Objective assessment and plan. We'll go into those each in, uh, individually. Subjective. Patient's wife kicked him out of the bedroom years ago. Witness apneas. Tired and sleepy and fatigued. Doesn't like the fact that he can't make it through the day without resting or napping. Also becoming forgetful. So basically in their words, you know, what, what's going on uh, subjectively? You want to talk about objective, Rich? Well, the objective, that's good, is are things that we can measure and we get these from where? From our sleep study, when was it, the date, what was the AHI, the supine AHI, the rim AHI, how low did their oxygen go? A lot of times that will be reported as the O2 nadir, N-A-D-A-I-R, the time that they spend below 90% as a percentage of the time that they're asleep. That seems to be more and more a predictor of the severity of sleep apnea, and that's one of the things we want to document. But we make notes like this in the objective part of that soap note, what's their range of motion? These are all things that we can measure. What's their ESS? Remember, that's the F worst sleepiness scale, the TSS, the Thornton snoring scale. So everything that we're asking them that we can actually measure in some way, we're going to put under this objective. And, uh, and then next we have assessment. Yeah, before I hit assessment, a question's coming through, uh, has been here for a little bit, and I think now's an appropriate time to address it. We'll try to address some of these throughout the webinar. Is how old can a sleep study be and still be valid to use? And uh, I think two years is a fair standard. If nothing's changed, they haven't gained a bunch of weight and so forth, there's really not a steadfast amount for that. I mean, if they've gained a lot of weight in the last six months, then the test is probably not valid anymore. If they haven't gained any weight and everything's the same and it's been five years ago, uh, 
then maybe in some cases you can use that. Do you have anything to add on that question? Oh, that's a good point. And the, the other thing I might add, too, is I've lost 100 pounds. Oh, yeah, you know, true. Every yeah. now and then, yeah, oh, we see people yeah. have mild sleep apnea, and they lose 100 pounds, and, and they're still wearing CPAP. Uh, we've treated them, and they don't have sleep apnea anymore when we retest them, but they still might snore, and they still might want a dental device. But those are all good points. I've seen people that had uh, lost 100 pounds. They, had, they were severe, and now we're treating a mild case, and their, their sleep study doesn't reflect that, uh, especially gastric bypass and some of the things that are lap band and so forth that are becoming more and more prominent. Assessment. Okay, assessment is basically the documentation of what the um, objective and subjective put together. It's a documentation of, mod in this case, in our scenario, a documented moderate obstructive sleep apnea as per PSG, has attempted three different CPAP masks over several months and failed to adapt to CPAP. OSA is currently on treatment. So it's basically our assessment of the patient up and in, to that point. And last, we get to plan. This is the P in our SOAP note, R, B, and A. Guy mentioned that earlier, risk, benefits, and alternatives of treatment options. Again, we're explaining the disease to these people. What are the risks if you don't treat it? We're basically learning that sleep apnea kills you, and if it's not cancer, it makes it worse. And now I think we're starting to wonder if it doesn't make cancer worse, too. Then is the patient a candidate? for dental device therapy or not, and do we have any other noteworthy items in our plan? Do we want to refer them to another doctor for evaluation or something like that? And we can consider ear, nose, and throat doctors, cardiologists. The list goes on and on. And then, and then we'll talk about what our treatment recommendation is. In this particular case, it's an EMA dental device, uh, which, of course, Keller Labs can make for you. I've been doing their devices for a long time now. And uh, you take a good impression and bite, and boy, they give you a great device back. You can also add E and D to that, and that's execution and disposition as well. I think occasionally we do that, and I still do that after being trained that way in dental school. All right, we're going to choose the most appropriate device. And I think I might have mentioned this in one of the last webinars, but people say, what's the best appliance? And there's really not a best one. It's per case. Certain ones work better with certain people who brucks or their range of motion uh, is wider or, or larger rather than in some cases to what their tongue size is. And do you want one that's a locked in position or allows movement? I think I, I used this analogy before, but it's kind of like do you like an SUV or a or a sports car? A certain situations, you know, if I'm going to go off the road or in the snow or something, I might rather have a four-wheel drive. But if we're uh, wanting to get somewhere fast, uh, we might want a, a sports car. And both of them are going to get you there, but the bells and whistles really maybe determine on certain features in and of the appliances. What does the literature tell us, Rich? Not much. There are to date, I believe, about a dozen studies that compare one device to another. And the bottom line is that nothing has come out as being perfect. I think your example of the, the car is, is very appropriate. If you want this type of car for this type of driving, uh, we just have to make devices. As dentists, you have to jump in and you have to do this. You have have to do your homework. I encourage you to come to our course in San Antonio and learn more. Uh, the people at Keller Lab are a very good resource. They make the TAP and the EMA. They're two different types of devices. Uh, one, the TAP, of course, pulls from the front, the EMA from the side. So when you look at that and you think, okay, the TAP, I can't lick my lips when I use the TAP. Uh, that bothers some people. It uh, doesn't seem to bother me, but others it does. The EMA, it, because the bands are on the outside, you tend to have a little bit more room for the tongue. So each one has a place, and at this point, I would pick one of those two and let Keller Labs make it because uh, we're lacking at this point in the literature for, for more information. All right, impressions and bite. Now, personally, I prefer uh, not using alginate, although alginate will work quite well, but then you've got to pour up the models and you've got to ship models. So if anybody has a question, I have a pretty good alginate substitute. Uh, I can't even remember what it's called right now. If you email me after the course, I'll be happy to tell you what, which one we use. And it's uh, one of the lesser expensive type of polyvinyls uh, that seems to be working quite well in my office. But I, something uh, polyvinyl type, I just think, uh, makes life easier. 
easier. You can send it to the lab, even though they're a little bit more expensive. Uh, I've been using the George gauge for for years, and uh, you know you've got to measure the range of motion and then determine on uh, where you're going to start the device. And you got to take a protrusive bite of some sort. I've also used the airway metrics, which I like, which are little jigs that have various vertical and horizontal points that you can lock the, the patient into and then take your bite with that. I've not used the tap gauge yet, although I saw it at the AADSM and I thought it looked pretty slick. Have you used that, Rich? Yes, I have, and it, it works very well. I think that the important thing is we want to measure their range of motion and have some easy way of capturing their bite in the position that we want to start them in. Correct, and most labs will make the device at your protrusive bite. So you are the doctor, and I think probably one of the more important things we do is where to start the device. And uh, we, again, in fact, it, we have a question. We have a question right there, guy, about you know what what is the best place to start the patient? And I think as a general rule, it's the most forward and comfortable position that they can stand. So when you use a George gauge or a tap gauge or airway metrics, any of those, and you take your bite with that, you can actually put that back in and have them sit there with that for a few minutes, which is what we typically do in my office. Is that bothering your jaw at all? No, no, it's not bad at all. So. I think as a general rule of thumb, about 40% is probably what most people can tolerate comfortably. If they can move 10 millimeters, obviously that's four. Most of the devices that we use have at least four to six, seven, eight millimeters of movement built in. So what you, the mistake that you don't want to do is to take a bite at one millimeter, and then the patient's treatment position is at 10, because not all of the devices have the ability to to go out that far. So uh, that's a good question, and, and I hope we answered that. Did, uh, you want to add anything to that? No, I, I tend to agree. Uh, it, it usually equates to between 40 and 60 percent of their maximum range of motion. And again, I like your idea of putting it in a place, make sure it's comfortable. Also, depending on which one you're doing, make sure that uh, you look and make sure that the bite's straight. They didn't bite to the left or right with the bite. That's another opportunity when you try it back in to make sure of that as well. Okay, device delivery. We've actually finally got the patient to where we've taken the impressions and the bite and we've sent it off to Keller. They're going to give us our device back. The tap, we're just going to try in the top. We're going to try in the bottom or the EMA, either one. We're going to check how they fit independently of each other, and then we're actually going to either hook the tap together or hook the, the bands up to that and put them in together. So remember, we don't want these to be orthodontic devices. We want them to fit and fit snugly. We don't want them to their teeth to fall out from that. And make sure that, like, like Guy said, make sure that their bite's not off one way or the other, even when we put that in with the tap, which just hits in the front, make sure that the posterior is not hitting. With the EMA, make sure that uh, the pads that are built up in the back, when you when you bite your teeth together, I want it hitting exactly the same on each side. One other little pearl I'll throw out there, too, is if you have a, an upper tooth that is pushed out towards the facial, a lot of times you'll see lateral incisors where that mesial line angle is, is mesial facial is pushed out uh, towards the facial. A lot of times Times I would just take and adjust that corner. So on an upper tooth, it would be something that's too far facial, and on a lower tooth, it would be something that's too far lingual. Say so you have one of the incisors down on the bottom that's pushed back uh, towards the tongue. We just go ahead and adjust that because those are the force vectors, and that's what's acting on those teeth when they put these devices in and they sleep with them. So adjust those types of things and check the bite, make sure everything else looks good, and then go over what you expect them to do and how they wear it and the home care instructions and all of those types of things. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit more next time when we do the uh, patient protocols. And uh, I, Yeah, I agree, Rich, on, on everything you said. I want to add a couple things. I'm a little bit lazier than you, and I like to put it on Keller on occasion. If I notice those teeth being lingual or facial, uh, you can just tell them to block out around those a little bit when they uh, construct the device and 
That way it's already done at the delivery because I totally agree. Any, any tooth that's out a lot further on the facial on the upper or on the lingual on the lower, uh, they'll end up getting discomfort out of that tooth. One of the things I'd like to add, I don't think you mentioned, is with the EMA device in particular, uh, you want to deliver that device with the number one white bands. Those are the longest and most flexible de- uh, bands. And uh, initially delivering it with those one band on each side, the white number ones uh, are the ones you want to start with. Good point. Homework. I always hated homework. Just the word just made me uneasy every time you hear it. We want to get our work done and not do it at home. But here we are tonight, and thanks, everybody, for being at home, most of you probably, and and working and learning more, and we appreciate your commitment. So I hope you're going to commit to learning more about sleep disorder breathing. You might want to dust off your old gross anatomy textbook, although mine still smells like formaldehyde. You might consider taking another gross anatomy course. I would love, you know, I really would love that opportunity. I've not done that since dental school, and uh, being 20 years old and in dental school, I didn't realize what a unique and wonderful opportunity that was, and uh, that would be a, a wonderful opportunity. You can work on uh, case acceptance skills. I think that if you go back to your office, have some staff meetings, some huddles, talk to your staff about, all right, now look, we talk about teeth, but here's the things we need to talk about when it comes to sleep apnea, snoring, and sleep disorder breathing. And let's put this in the front of our minds and, and start talking to our patients. Uh, talking to them will end up in doing appliances, I promise you. Part of that homework, we mentioned this last time. There are a couple of textbooks out there. One is the uh, Dr. Hokema's thesis that he did on oral appliance therapy, and you can get that exclusively through the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine. They have it, I believe it's $20, something like that. Uh, we also mentioned the Principles and Practices of Sleep Medicine. It's been revised several times. I'm not sure what edition they're in now. Uh, do you know, Guy, fifth or sixth, something like that? I think it's the fifth. I read the fourth. I, the best I, I recall. Fifth. And that that thing is it's I'm not one of the positive best. On that. Te- yeah, but it's one of the best textbooks I've ever read. It's just amazingly how well that that thing is put together. It take you a year to read that thing. But if you want to learn about what restless leg syndrome is, then pick up that textbook and read it. If you want to learn about insomnia, what's the difference between initiation insomnia and maintenance insomnia? And again, this is all knowledge that helps you talk to your patients. It helps you talk to your physician colleagues. When you get in front of them and you begin to speak their language, your uh, value goes up in their mind that you know more about this than they thought you did, and they're more likely to refer you patients. So, You know, Rich, uh, I keep that one right by my bed at night every night because it's as heavy as a baseball bat in case there's an intruder. <laughs> <laughs> it it would yeah. knock somebody out. Yeah, it's a pretty it. heavy book, but uh, I do agree it's a great book. Commit to learn more about sleep disorder breathing. I mean, it's a fun, exciting, I mean, you wouldn't think sleep was as fun and exciting, but uh, I hope you pick up on Rich and my passion for this and excitement. It is, it is just, it's the most growing area in dentistry. Get involved in it. You're changing and saving people's lives and and you can add your bottom line all at the same time so anytime you can learn more about anything in the sleep realm as far as dentistry then I, we recommend you get involved and attend all of the rest of our webinars speaking of that as well we want to talk about the keller webinar special because they treat you right for uh, tuning in to us and spending your evenings with us we appreciate that yeah, and the, this is a, most of these uh, device manufacturers are starting to come out with some type of trial appliance or something like that. And EMA calls theirs the first step. Uh, it's made by EMA, and it's – or you can actually make this in your office. So you can get uh, these kits for $69, or you can have Keller make it for 89 I know in my office it takes me about 10 or 15 minutes is all to make this now. So it's considered a trial appliance. The uh, plastic that they make it out of, the suck down material is 0.03 instead of the 2.5 mil. So it it doesn't last as long, but it's a less expensive way to get one of those patients who's kind of sitting on the fence and you just can't get them to commit to making a full device, then you can try this. And I know uh, Keller's special is that if you order two of these, uh, they're going to give you one for free. And we can't say enough about Keller. Uh, Jason Tierney has been great at helping us put all these things together and helping us out. And I uh, also want to thank Nathan Drake for helping us. And uh, uh, last but not least, we want you to think about attending our in-person course in San Antonio. Again, 
again, this is a full day course, and you're going to get a lot of great information, and it's only $95 for the dentist and 45 for the staff. Uh, San Antonio is a great place to visit this time of year. Anything else you want to say, Guy, wrapping it up? No, I, I think you mentioned that uh, you know no one's ever done this before. I don't think you clarified. I don't know of any course that you're going to get this kind of education for 95 That's I think what you meant to say earlier. For $95, I don't see how you can say no to not coming, especially if you're in and around that area anyway, anybody who happens to be. Um, where to go next? Also, make sure you listen to our other three webinars. Uh, again, you're already signed up for those, uh, so you don't have to do anything special. The next one's uh, September 14th. We're going to go over patient protocols, and then October 12th, we're going to talk about how you adjust or, or what we call titrate dental devices, uh, managing side effects, very key, important, because you will have some side effects, but they're, most of them are very manageable. And then lastly, as we mentioned, practice marketing and medical insurance billing, the big mystery there we hope to um, unveil or unravel for you. So we thank you. Um, again, remember about the, the CE credit to follow the directions, answer the quiz, and supplies with information <laughs> that you need. So, Sounds sound like it's time to go. The dog's barking. So I think it's time to call in the dogs. <laughs> so most of it, well, I know we've got a few other questions we didn't get to. Hey, hey, hang on just a second. Okay, I know we didn't... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a few questions that we didn't get to. Uh, Rich and I are certainly available to, if we didn't address something, email us. We'll either address it in the next uh, webinar or we'll be happy to answer your questions back. If you have any more questions about Dental Sleep Solutions, our franchise, how we can get you rapidly involved in dental sleep medicine, we'd love to talk to you about that because we truly feel we've developed the turnkey solution for dentists who want to get involved in this. And we'll be happy to share more with that about you if you just contact us at dentalsleepsolutions.com. And again, thanks to Keller Lab and Jason Tierney. I think that's about all I have. Good night. Have a good evening.